Hi, everybody. Welcome to Community Conversations in our new fancy online format. I'm so excited that uh, a lot of you and some names I recognize on the attendees list, some of our regulars are with us again today that you figured out how to do the Zoom. Remember also that we do record these. And so if you want to tell a friend or come to another session, but you can't make it at Thursday at noon, we do record them and then usually the next day we'll have them up on the LCC Community Conversations website. That is at lowercolumbia.edu slash conversations. And that also has our full schedule for the quarter, which includes next week's session. Next week's session is led by Alex Brem and he is the Fighting Smelt LCC debate team uh, leader, the faculty advisor for the LCC debate, debate team. And they're going to be taking on the big issues, don't know what those issues are yet, but I'm sure it'll be hot button. And uh, they will be discussing and uh, giving sort of a, a sample of how debate works um, with the LCC uh, fighting school. So please join us next week for that. Reminder, we'll also have a question and answer session at the end of this. And so if you see on your controls, usually at the bottom, but sometimes at the top, there is a, uh, a button for Q&A, and you can go in there and post a question to our presenters, and I will moderate those questions at the end of the session. Last reminder is uh, to my Humanities 106 students, reminder that your papers are due Tuesdays at 12 noon, and if you um, have any questions to feel free to contact me. So, with all of that out of the way, I want to welcome today's presenters. Uh, we're lucky to have uh, two members of the LCC Lang and Lit Department here to uh, uh, bestow upon us uh, their, their critical eye. Uh, Abby Levins is an instructor of English at Lower Columbia College, hired in 2016. She is the advisor for L the LCC Multicultural Club and is the current advisor for the Salal Review, LCC's literary and visual arts magazine. She's a member of the Diversity and Equity Committee. Uh, she is a Midwest transplant by way of a brief stint in California, and she remains in awe of the beauty found in the Pacific Northwest. I'm sensing a theme because our next presenter is Chris Tower. And Chris Tower followed his wife in moving to the Pacific Northwest, driving cross country with his two dogs and his 80 year old dad. He did not imagine that he would fall in love with his new home and find the best school in which he has ever had the pleasure to be faculty at Lower Columbia College in the Lang and Lit department. Uh, though the comic shop in Kalamazoo, Michigan is still the best on earth and cooler than anything else here. Ooh, them's fighting words. Everything else is better and there are mountains. Though Chris wasted his college internship at Mar Marvel Comics by not returning and working in the industry, instead doing silly things like graduate school, he estimates he has spent almost 100,000 on comic books in his lifetime, most of which he had to leave in his dad's basement. So please welcome Abby and Chris. Pop, 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 pop. Hello everyone, thank you for having us. Thank you for coming. Um, I would like everyone to, I would, I would invite you all to take a deep breath in and fully exhale. So before we begin, I'd like to invite you to consider a few things. The first is the title of this presentation, Comic Books as a Vehicle for Anti-Racism or comic books as a vehicle for social change. Two phrases stick out to me, comic books and anti-racism. One is a text, a medium, a genre. The other, a goal, a lens. According to the Alberta Civil Liberties Research Center, anti-racism is the active process of identifying and eliminating racism by changing systems, organizational structures, policies, practices, and attitudes so that power is redistributed and shared equitably. I'd like you to consider the last piece of that definition specifically. So that power is redistributed and shared equitably. There's power in comics. Maybe you have a vested interest in comic books already, but whether you do or you don't, I'd like you to consider the various roles that you embody in the world. Perhaps that is the role of a student or an educator, an artist, 
a business person or a consumer. Perhaps that is the role of a parent or a child or a friend. To be truly anti-racist requires a continuous intentional effort for white identifying people as well as non-white identifying people who have existed in the systems of America for centuries. This work can quickly feel overwhelming. So rather than dismissing it as a place of entry, I'd invite you to consider the roles which you embody and the ways in which you can choose to be intentionally anti-racist through the utilization of those roles. And now Christopher Tower. Ooh, very few people get to call me Christopher. That's a special, that's a special thing. Um, so this presentation is about comic books and anti-racism. Uh, and currently here you see an image from an issue of actually uh, the comic was called um, Superman's Girlfriend Lois Lane, um, in which uh, Lois Lane is magically transformed into a woman of color uh, and spends a day uh, that way uh, to learn about racism. Uh, and this is a huge oversimplification of the issue of racism, uh, as nothing about the experience of being a person of color in America can be learned by playing dress up for a day. Now, while I was in the creation process of this presentation and getting a bit too lost in the trees and having lost sight of the forest as a whole, my, my speaking partner and colleague, Abby uh, Levins, asked me, what's the big idea here? Aren't we supposed to be talking about big ideas? And I realized right away that she was asking a very astute question. So how is this idea big in the way of ideas like last week's presentation on public health and communicable diseases by Michelle Ashby or the future subjects to be presented in this series? So I hope the answer to this question uh, touches more than just comic books, uh, but ultimately finds a personal response as well. Um, so, oh boy, notes problems. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, even before the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many others just this year, people were discussing that being against racism was not significant enough of a catalyst for social change, and that to make a real paradigm shift, people should commit themselves to being anti-racist. After all, hmm. That's strange, all right, there we go. <laughs> Working out the technical difficulties of moving these slides along. After all, the book, How to Be Anti-Racism, or Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kennedy, um, that came out in 2018. He's a columnist for The Atlantic and his previous book, Stamped uh, from the Beginning, won the National Book Award in 2016. Um, that was already in the public consciousness. Uh, but now with the Black Lives Matter protests that have been held all around the world for many months, more people than ever are committed to not just being against racism, but being actively anti-racist. As Kendi writes in his introduction, being anti actively anti-racist is the struggle to be fully human and see that others are fully human as a culture. Uh, we know how to be racist. We know how to pretend to not be racist. Let's try to figure out how to be anti-racist. But what does all this talk of anti-racism and our current movement of Black Lives Matter have to do with comic books? Well, it's gonna take two clicks for every single one of these. <laughs> As Captain America reminds the jingoistic villain Nuke, America is the country of immigrants. Uh, and that is that it is patriotic to fight for the American dream, uh, which is to fight for the peaceful lives of people regardless of heritage, religion, or the socially constructed idea of race. The question of whether or not comic books can be a vehicle for social change or for anti-racism should be obvious. <clears throat> Any art form can be a catalyst for social change, in particular, anti-racism. The more interesting questions are how comic books have already created social change, change and promoted anti-racist agendas, and how they're going to take this goal even farther, inspired by the recent rise of Black Lives Matter protests, uh, have shown us that people are fed up with the systemic racism in our country. And so here's the thesis of the presentation. 
Comic books are ideally suited as an art form for social change, such as anti-racism, among other battles against bigotry. And though other art forms also do the same work, the impact and popularity of comic books provide unique opportunities for changing mindsets. Now, as Courtney mentioned in the introduction, I've been a comic book nerd uh, my whole life, basically since the age of four. Um, this is my first comic book, Detective Comics number 351 from May of 1966, which was obviously inspired by the Batman TV show, which uh, debuted in January of 1966. Like many people my age and older and younger, comic books were the constant companions of our youth. In his book, Com comic Book Nation, The Transformation of Youth Culture in America, Maryland University Professor Bradford W. Wright discovered that the heroes in comic books were more believable than those in his real life of the 1960s and early 70s. In comics, he discovered a fantasy world that made more sense than the real one. Later, looking back as an adult, he realizes that comic books had not only afforded me an escape from reality, they helped me to perceive reality in, in terms that I could understand and accept. Comic books helped me to define myself and my world in a way that made both far less frightening. I honestly can ima cannot imagine how I would have navigated my childhood without them. This was the same experience that I had, and I would suspect that many other people would, would claim that they had the exact same experience. Um, and one of them is this, this individual, uh, writer-artist Scott McCloud, who in 1993 publishes the book Understanding Comics, the Indiv in Invisible Art, which is a graphic novel about comic books and how comic books work um, and defining them uh, as an art form. Here's two panels from the beginning of the book as Scott, who draws himself narrating the entire book, explains about the stereotypes and misconceptions about comic books. He knew exactly what comic books were. So in the lingo of comic books, a panel is the box in which you find the image and often the writing uh, to go with it, as seen here on this page. There's eight panels on the slide, uh, two of which do not really have borders around their images, number two and seven. Comics are read left to right, like all our Western world books, starting at the top uh, left for each new page, uh, as seen in these two pages, which are side by side on this slide. Scott explains, how he discovered comics at a much later age than I did. Uh, but we both had the same experience of getting hooked on them because we sensed their hidden power. Thus began a lifelong love of readership of comics, comic books, and graphic novels. Like me, throughout his life, Scott ha has fought against the cultural bigotry toward comics, which may seem strange today given their popularity in movies, televisions, conventions, and even in the curricula of colleges and universities. Comics can be about anything. They can tell all kinds of stories. They are much more than the funnies about talking ducks or tales of 1950s style Riverdale students and their suburbs or superheroes. Because of the subject of this presentation, I'll speak primarily of comics portraying superheroes. Though in the end, I will broaden that definition to talk about many comic books that do not feature superheroes at all. Scott works to define comics in this book, and it's really a brilliant novel, and you should read it if you have any interest at all in comic books as an art form. Uh, and I'm very carefully repeating that over and over again because a lot of times people misconceive comics as a genre uh, of fiction as a whole, and in the really a completely separate art form. As you can see here, uh, Scott begins his definition with comics as a, a sequential art form, similar to film, in which stories are told by placing pictures in sequence and usually adding writing to those images for narration and dialogue. Examining the history of comics provides an understanding for how comics have influenced our culture quite unlike other art forms and have continued kindled unique inspiration in the hearts of their readers. The superhero comic books we know today come from the traditional pulp magazines and the radio shows they spawn, deriving from the penny dreadfuls of Britain uh, their name for the cheap paper made from pulp on which they were printed. Pulp magazines, also simply known as pulps, became an American phenomenon that transformed publishing from about 1896 to the late 1950s. The hero uh, pulps, specifically, 
featured a, a wide range of fiction from romance to sports to science fiction and horror. They introduced many characters still famous and popular today, such as the Tarzan creator, Edgar Rice Burroughs creation, John Carter of Mars, seen here, as well as Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, Doc Savage, and The Shadow, who may be the most obvious origin of the Batman, one of the first superheroes in comic books that will soon follow. The downside here, like in comics, is that these are stories of the domination of the white man and the subjugation of other cultures. After all, when an author conceives a story that an orphan British lord becomes king of the African jungle rather than one of the indigenous people of coastal West Africa, we're definitely dealing with uh, what um, the uh, musician speech of the band Arrested Development would call a false narrative uh, in the song Kings from the 2018 album Craft and Optics. Uh, he referred to this false narrative as creating in the minds of white people a false sense of superiority and in the minds of African American people a false sense of inferiority. Designed with cover art for impulse purchases from the newsstands from which they were sold, pulps were often sensational, lurid, and exploitative, as we see here. But like comics, they had the same hidden power to transform and catalyze readership. For instance, Black Mask, launched in 1920 by famous journalist H.L. Mencken and drama critic George Jean Nathan, made enough money to support Mencken's prestigious literary magazine, The Smart Set, and launched the careers of famous writers like Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Though we can trace the concept of the comic to medieval Europe or even ancient Asia, the cartoons of William Hogarth from the 18th century or early newspaper strips like the yellow kids seen here are among the first modern conceptions of what we think of as comics, as well as the many strips that followed, such as Little Orphan and Annie, The Cats and Jammer Kids, Ripley's Believe It or Not, uh, Blondie, Dick Tracy, and so on. The first publication that we would think of as comic books uh, was the famous Funnies, published in 1933 that reprinted newspaper strips. Shortly thereafter, uh, we get the first superheroes. Mainly comic books as we know them really started with the advent of the superhero in 1938 with the emergence of Superman, the first of the superheroes who would come to dominate in comics. Created by first generation Jewish immigrants, writer Jerry Siegel and artist Joe Schuster, Superman is an obvious takeoff on the idea of the Ubermensch, the Superman popular in Nazi Germany at the time. But soon he became the most enduring and iconic of the superheroes, even powerful enough to advertise imitation, imitation cheese spread, uh, as you see here. Even though he's an alien from another planet, he becomes the symbol of the American way. Superman is the super immigrant. Batman comes next. In May of 1939, and unlike Superman, whose powers come from the sun, Batman is without superpowers, but has honed his natural human characteristics to extraordinary levels. He's the natural progression of the pulp hero of the shadow. If Superman is light and sunshine, then Batman is darkness and moonlight maybe too dark, and he softened shortly after his debut and given a child to foster, a ward, so that he can be a father without introducing the complications of a mother or of marriage. He doesn't actually adopt the kid, he's, he's his ward. Um, and from there, things really take off. More and more heroes are created. Many of those early heroes will survive to be reimagined what we know today as the Justice League, of, of DC Comics. But you should notice in this, in this, photo, in this image uh, a real uh, homogeneity uh, of, of a type of individual um, and only one woman character. And then Marvel will explode later on and we'll talk about that, uh, but not for about 20 years. And more and more characters would be created. Along with Wonder Woman, there'll be more uh, women characters that are still iconic today, as we see here with Mary Marvel, the uh, uh, sister of uh, the, what we now know as the Shazam character, which was then known as Captain Marvel. 
And as the era of comic book superhero dawns at the end of the 1930s, as America begins to shrug off the Great Depression, the Second World War sweeps through Europe, officially starting around 1939, and soon after, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, and the United States goes to war in the Pacific. While at home, comic books show new readers just how powerful America is and can be. World War II is very good for comic books. Comic books go overseas. At least 35,000 copies of Superman alone are shipped to the troops each month during the war. By 1942 in America, 15 million comic books are being sold each month. The publishers report that for every one purchase, five additional people read those comic books. That's 75 million people. The US population at this time is only 135 million people. By the end of 1943, 125 different comic book titles are published every month and sales grow to at least $30 million, which you know was huge in the 40s. Though Superman alone could have stopped World War II in a few minutes, and though some heroes did directly confront the great enemies of America in the war, as we see here, like Captain America, mostly they were portrayed as soldiers serving in the military or heroes fighting against the infiltrators at home. Comic books enjoy another surge in the 1950s with primarily romance, horror, science fiction, and true crime titles. Over 650 different titles are published each month, grossing at least $90 million in sales each month in 1953. Some estimate that, oh, that there was over $100 million of revenue each month from comic books alone. American readers spent over a billion dollars of their own money on comic books in 1953. 90% of boys and girls under 18 read comic books at this time. And survey estimates revealed that 25% of high school graduates also read them. Uh, but the, the, that number is likely far too low. Uh, American GIs are still choosing comics as their literature of choice by the thousands. Though these sales and readership could not be maintained for reasons to be explained later, comics enjoyed another surge of popularity from 1962 to 67 with the dawn of what is known as the Marvel Age of Comics for the resurgence of the company Marvel Comics. With the new direction and new characters that were created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Though, Though Marvel sales doubled through those years, they remained a close second to their competitor, the home of Superman and Batman, DC Comics. But unlike their competitor, Marvel enjoyed immense popularity on college campuses. 50,000 college students joined the Marvel fan club, and a 1965 college poll showed that college students ranked Spider-Man and the Hulk alongside Bob Dylan and Che Guevara as their favorite revolutionary icons. Despite the declining popularity of comic books, which in the 1970s and 1980s looked like they were never to regain the wide readership of the 1940s and 50s, despite how throughout my formative years, much like Scott McCloud's, we argued for comics to be taken seriously or hit our passions for fear of ridicule and bullying, that has all changed. Really, it started with the DC Batman movies around 1989 uh, and kids growing up on television animated series like uh, those of featuring Batman, the X-Men, Spider-Man, and Teen Titans cartoons. And now the Marvel movies, which have enjoyed popularity and revenue the likes of which most of us comic fans sure, and the surely the creators never dreamed. Reaping worldwide box office growth in the billions of dollars. The Marvel parent company, which is now owned by Disney, and the DC company, which is now owned by Warner Brothers, have made undreamed of riches. Little to none of it has returned to the creators of these properties, as they were considered work for hire writers and artists and did not own the fruits of their imaginations. Returning to the fantasy comment I made earlier by Bradford Wright, that this fantasy world of heroes made more sense than the real one. The superheroes with their bright costumes, their superpowers, their catchy names, are our modern mythology. Many are styled on classic gods and goddesses such as Superman, who is very much like Apollo, 
or the original Flash seen here, who is very much like Hermes, or are actually gods themselves. Oops. The specter. They appeal to our better natures. They espouse the values we all hold dear. They fight for the common good or our very survival as a species or a planet. This is an image from the 1940s issue of Wonder Woman in which she espouses the need for justice, love, and respect to fight against persecution and intolerance. But again, you should notice that, that all of, every single person um, depicted in the art, as my friend and colleague Gabby pointed out when we were talking about this earlier, are white. Um, so comics weren't exclusively progressive. Um, and the roots that they have in the pulps were rife with racist tropes. Comic books reflected much of the same ide ideology that, that reflected the ideology dominant in the culture of the times. The Captain America, or excuse me, the Captain Marvel uh, of the 1940s, who we now know as Shazam, as per the movie from last year, had a sidekick named Steamboat. Sidekick may be too generous of a term because he's essentially served as Captain Mar uh, Marvel's de facto servant until 1945, when on appeal from school children, the character was no longer used. Whatever the awful features were used to depict the ally of Captain America's sidekick, Bucky Barnes, whitewashed Jones were amplified with Steamboat, and he carried himself with the same poor English and bumbling persona as his young ally's counterpart, the team Bucky led. Whitewashed Jones seen here, come, who uh, was depicted in Young Allies Number 1 from the summer of 1941, while his given name was Washington Carver Jones, the character was sadly known as Whitewash Jones. Uh, and while part of, uh, of the crew, um, he was only apparently good at de-watermelon and could make a harmonica talk. He looked like the worst minstrel show rendition of a black person and was a bumbling idiot to boot and was drawn to look more like a monkey than an actual human. Uh, and Steamboat seen here as well from America's Greatest Comics in February of 1942, uh, you know, is serving as, as Captain Marvel's actual servant. To say these depictions of black characters were uncommon at the time would be a lie. And it is useful to understand that while we were fighting injustice and oppression on one side of the world against the Nazis and the Japanese, we were buying it up left and right on our own soul, soil here at home. Depictions of other people uh, than the heroes were just as terrible during this period. Um, as a nation, Americans may have never hated a foreign population as intensely as they did the Japanese following the stunning attack on Pearl Harbor. Reflecting on this deep hostility, American media and popular culture abounded with racist caricatures of the Japanese. Comic books proved uniquely suited to portray uh, the Asian enemy, as many Americans saw him, a sinister, ugly, subhuman creature, ghastly yellow demons with fangs and claws, or buck-toothed little monkeys in oversized spectacles. Comic book Japanese appeared subhuman, inhuman, or even superhuman, but never simply human. Stories with titles like The Terror of the Slimy Japs or The Slant Eye of Satan glorified the American violence righteously unleashed on the yellow peril. Though comic books often served as propaganda for national unity against the wartime enemies, many define national unity meant in terms of racial and ethnic tolerance. DC Comics call for an inclusive America at this time, reminding readers that the Nazis came to power by exploiting the hatreds and prejudices of the German people, hoping to infiltrate our country with the same divide and conquer strategy. In one comic of the time, foiling these plans of the Nazis, the Justice Society reminds readers that the United States is a great melting pot into which other races are poured, a pot which converts all of us into one big nation. Likewise, in a Green Lantern comic story entitled A Tale of a City in 1944, the hero makes one of the strongest statements of tolerance found anywhere in wartime comics. As he foils the divisive schemes of the hateful villains, he admonished that you deliberately confuse patriotism with race hatred for one purpose, to make money. Chided, the woman uh, who's the main villain, admits that she had been a fool. If only this happened in real life. 
Though the progressive existed, racist and hate-filled messages threatened to overwhelm them during the comic books of the war years. Nevertheless, this era is known as the golden age of comics. Uh, and it showed the power comics possessed to motivate and galvanize audiences. In this case, reinforcing the immediacy of the war uh, to the young at home, the, the young home front audience, uh, fighting it largely on imagination alone. The war was a simple time with a clear enemy. Hoping, hoping to build on the sizable market established, comic book publishers would find that things were much more complicated in the post-war era. The progressive messages, though, continued, such as this one from a 1951 Superboy comic in which Superboy inspires young readers to respect others and not judge anyone on the basis of their color or beliefs. But the popularity of comics to entertain and to inspire encountered a backlash as all progressive movements encounter backlashes. For every step forward, there are often two steps backward as people resist change and the traditions of their own intolerance. In 1948, students of the St. Patrick's Parochial School of Binghamton, New York, gained notoriety for burning over 2,000 comic books in a huge bonfire, part of a boycott the comics uh, stressed because the comics stressed crime and sex. Ever since they had first appeared on American newsstands, comic books had been under attack by parents, teachers, librarians, and guardians of traditional culture. Critics charged that comic books caused eye strain, promoted illiteracy, celebrated bad taste, and encouraged antisocial behavior in children. This was not the first bonfire uh, in, in, in Binghamton. There were, there were many across the country during this period. Um, throughout uh, American history, adults have attributed undesirable changes in youth uh, to some aspect of popular culture. This is the same exact ac accusation that has been made uh, against rock and roll, television, punk music, hip hop music, and today against things like video games, social media, and smartphone apps, all of which may seem to you more influ influential and capable of fomenting social change than comic books. And perhaps this is true. I never said that comic books alone could create social change. During this time, a psychiatrist named Frederick Wortham would write a book called The Seduction of the Innocent, a condemnation of comic books, charging them as leading a leading cause of a scourge feared in the post-war suburbs, juvenile delinquency. For those interested, in 2008, David Haju uh, wrote a great book on this era and the fight against censorship uh, seen here called The Tencent Plague. In it, he, he, he quoted Frederick Wortham, who said in his book, I think Hitler was a beginner compared to the comic book industry, as he wrote in The Seduction of the Innocent, uh, which indicted comic books as the leading cause of juvenile delinquency. The time has come to legislate these books off the newsstands and out of the candy stores, he wrote. Despite the flames engulfing thousands of comics at this time, EC Comics transform the industry and the readership of comic books. Originally known as educational comics and renamed as entertaining comics, EC published some of the most pioneering and innovative comics of all time, such as Tales from the Crypt, Weird Science, and The Vault of Horror. With some of the best artists and writers in the industry, the comics were aimed at adults and read by all ages. They were immensely popular. Publishers competed for readership with increasingly more shocking and extreme imagery and storylines. Stan Lee, later famous for Marvel Comics, who was working for Timely, at, uh, at another company at this time, described the problem as, the horror craze was a challenge for the average publisher because you had to come up with new ideas for every story. Not everybody could do it. Books came and books went because they petered out. The editors couldn't sustain the interest. So they used a lot of tricks to get the reader's attention. At the time, under Lee's stewardship, Timely was the most successful publisher in 1952, with sales half again as great as other publishers, uh, like Dell or uh, DC. Still, publishers scrambled to outdo each other, gain readers, and match EC's success. If a character had his neck slashed in February, in the March issue, a character would be decapitated. In another issue, a human head would be used as a bowling ball. And in another, a woman would be shown roasting her husband's body parts on a barbecue grill. Such content sparked a national campaign against comic books. 
the biggest loser was EC, who was driven virtually out of business except for one pub publication, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. Like millions uh, were massacred in World War II, comic books suffered a gutting and a cultural war that left hundreds of talented artists scared off or even blacklisted. The national crusade against cor the corrupting influence of comic books led to bonfires, as I showed earlier, and eventually Senate hearings uh, that most abused William Gaines and EC Comics. The only EC Comic publication to survive, and it still has survived through to this day, is Mad Magazine, which was rebranded as a magazine to circumvent the self-censoring of the Comic Code Authority. Now owned by DC and Warner Brothers, MAD is uh, uh, continuing to shape generations as it has since the 1950s with satire, parody, and a no holds barred mocking of American culture. Uh, but that topic alone could be a whole presentation by itself. So moving on. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> with the clicking. Uh, though comics suffered, they limped into the 1960s to herald in a new era of comics ushered by a rejuvenated company around uh, since the 1940s, Marvel Comics. Marvel Comics changes the industry forever and ushers in what is known as the Silver Age of Comics. Masterminded by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee and what became known as the Marvel Bullpen, Marvel Comics affirmed the individual's obligation to society, as did other publishers. The difference here were the tragic characters and stories with grim endings. When Peter Parker's father figure, Uncle Ben, is killed in a crime he could have prevented, he becomes the hero Spider-Man because with great power comes great responsibility. Every time I say that, I get chills. I just got the chills. That's so, that's so weird. If there is one idea that comic books instills in its readers, inspiring legions of readers, it's that uh, profound credo from Spider-Man. As the voice of Marvel Comics, Stan Lee talks directly to readers in a hip, youthful tone that is still mimicked today. When the civil rights movement of the late 1960s takes center stage in the nation, Stan Lee uses his platform to directly inspire readers to be anti-racist. He gives voice to the justice and the underlining philosophy of all comics, but especially Marvel Comics, to judge each other on our own merits. I first read these words as a child, and they became part of my soul the very fabric of my being. That's why I argue that comics are uniquely suited to inspire social change. When I became an adult, the ideas of anti-racism just seemed natural and sensible. And though I have had to uncover the invisible ways my white privilege has per perpetuated systemic racism in this country, the process of self-realization to fight for what's right has always been a no-brainer. And that brings us to the Black Panther. Even before Stan's soapbox, Marvel created the first black superhero in the Black Panther. Though only coincidentally named the same as a black militant group, Jack Kirby invented the Black Panther in 1966 as the king of an African nation called Wakanda, a scientifically advanced, though hidden nation. T'Challa, the real name of the Black Panther, was a genius, a diplomat, and a powerful warrior. Oh. I actually have a, a, a Hello Panther shirt modeled on Hello Kitty, and I was looking for it, I couldn't find it, so I went with this. This is Jack Kirby, um, but from later in his career. Um, just FYI. Though there were questionable stereotypes still in play, this creation was pivotal to changing comics in the hearts and minds of readers. The Black Panther soon became a member of the Avengers and one of the most beloved characters in the Marvel Canyon, and arguably my favorite. Recently, Marvel Media released the Black Panther film with an almost entirely African-American cast of men and women from the fictional Wakanda. I'll confess that as soon as I started watching the film, I, I, I began to cry. I was so overwhelmed by the, the fulfilling of a dream of, uh, for Black people to take center stage over white people in a mega hit future film uh, that I had pretty much the same reaction uh, when we've seen some women heroes put in that star role to inspire young women uh, to be all that they can be and the equal of anyone else. I find it incredibly emotionally moving, but probably because I'm a huge comic book nerd and I've been dreaming of these days since I was a little kid. So likewise, um, in trying to be progressive over at DC, 
1969, Julius Schwartz, Schwartz hired Young Guns' Dennis O'Neill, who just passed away, RIP, and Neil Adams to revitalize the failing Green Lantern comic. Inspired by Norman Mailer and Tom Wolfe, O'Neill and Adams created socially relevant stories about racism, poverty, political corruption, overpopulation, and many other topics. They not only created the second prominent African-American hero seen here, a black man as the uh, next Green Lantern, but directly confronted the issue of white privilege and the responsibility of white heroes to fight for everyone, especially with those as black, with black skins, as we see this man as Green Lantern in the panels on the right. Though not successful in terms of sales, the stories produced by these creators continue to inspire readers today as the issues confronted are still ongoing concerns and very relevant. In fact, nothing has really changed. It's, oh, it may have just gotten worse. Um, though Marvel Comics also confronted social issues of racism, drugs, and poverty, many more pages and many more stories were devoted to the persecution of mutants in the X-Men comic books. Yet, as an analogy for the social ills of America, the Merry Mutants of Marvel became one of the company's most popular and enduring properties. Back to Scott. In the year 2000, DC comic publisher uh, published Scott McCloud's Reinventing Comics, the sequel to Understanding Comics. Once again, he wrote about the power of comics to be anything, to do anything, to be unique and an influential vehicle for so, so, blah, social change, as I argue in my thesis. He actually calls the concept a big idea, right, in this book, uh, like the theme of this quarter's community conversations. Eloquently, he posits that a single panel in a comic book, even a silent one with no words, may speak volumes in one book, while whole pages of another tell us very little. He lauded comics, creator-owned comics, digital comics that were changing the industry and inspiring legions of readers. Comics such as Raw uh, in the upper left by Art Spiegelman and Francoise Mouly, Love and Rockets by Gilbert and Jaime Hernandez, and Cerebus by Dave Sim, among many, many others that start to come out um, in the 80s. This entire pre presentation is, is really just a scratch of the surface of comic books and intersections with anti-racism diversity, inclusion, and creative ownership. However, the presentation would not be complete without at least a brief mention of Milestone Media, founded in 1993 by a coalition of African-American artists and writers. And though it only survived to about 1996, it spawned an animated series, Static Shock, which is uh, the character in the hat uh, next to the guy with the big uh, green cape, uh, that won both an Emmy and a Humanitas Prize. Uh, since then, the parent company of DC Comics has attempted several revivals, the most recent just this year uh, with Milestone Returns number zero, which just came out. Sadly, the chief mastermind of this company and these comics, Dwayne McDuffie, passed away in 2011 of complications from heart surgery. So as I conclude my portion before uh, we get into a free for all with Abby and I as, I, as we riff on topics and take your questions, uh, I have a sample reading list of the comic books uh, uh, that superheroes inspired or the ways in which superhero comics have strived to be more, more inclusive, diverse, and uh, anti-racist. So the first um, is Superman Smashes the Klan uh, by Jean uh, Yang, uh, author of American Born Chinese uh, and drawn by Gary Hiru. Uh, which just came out last year in October of 2019. Uh, it's this great story uh, of, of Superman fighting against uh, a, a clan that is uh, harassing uh, Asian people in Metropolis um, and uh, reinvents some aspects of Superman's origin. And uh, it's aimed at young adults, but it's, it's, you know, like, you know, a lot of young adult books that people of all ages would enjoy. I absolutely loved it. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. And of course, American Born Chinese, which is a great uh, book by uh, Gene Yang that was a finalist for the National Book Award in 2006. Very timely to mention, there are three volumes of, of the comic graphic novel March that tell the story of Congressperson and civil rights advocate John Lewis, who is a co-author along with uh, two others, an artist, 
um, telling in, in black and white um, art uh, the story of the civil rights movement um, and the role that John Lewis played in that. And, and this started coming out in 2015. Um, and and uh, again, RIP uh, John Lewis. Palestine um, came out in 1993. Uh, it's a non-fictional graphic novel by Joe Sacco. Uh, and about his experiences in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in December of 1991 through January 1992. Um, Sacco's portrayal of the situation emphasizes the history and plight of the Palestinian people as, as a group and as individuals. And then, for you Star Trek fans, um, George Takai, who played Sulu, uh, They Called Us Enemy, uh, a graphic memoir of his uh, time uh, as a child imprisoned in the American concentration camps uh, during World War II, uh, where they put uh, um, Japanese Americans. Um, it's a gripping tale. Uh, it's, yeah, really good. And Sulu, big, big fan. Persepolis uh, was, uh, has been made into a movie, uh, graphic novels, two volumes from 2000, uh, an autograph biographical series of vignettes by Marjane Satrapi uh, depicts her childhood up to her adults, adult years in Iran um, uh, during uh, and after the Islamic Revolution. Uh, the title Persepolis is a reference to the ancient capital of the Persian Empire. Maus is a, one of the best known of, of these uh, graphic novels and comics uh, that, that uh, um, have done a lot of this great work. Pulitzer Prize winner, American Book Award winner, Art Spiegelman, who I mentioned earlier because uh, he worked on Raw, serialized it from 1980 to 1991. Uh, experiences uh, interviewing his father, uh, who was a Polish Jew and a Holocaust survivor. Um, the Jews are uh, represented as mice in, in, in the graphic novel, the Germans are cats, and the Poles are uh, pigs. Some other new comics that I've just recently discovered or are dear to my heart. Escape from uh, Syria, a book by uh, Samia Kulab from uh, 2017, um, is um, a, a breathtaking story of a family struggle to survive in the face of war, displacement, poverty, and relocation in Syria. Um, Satchel Page, or Striking Out Jim Crow, um, was an NAACP Image Award uh, winner for outstanding literary work, and my dog Satchel is named after the great Negro League pitcher uh, seen here, so I, I had to mention it. It's a really good book, though, too. The Influencing Machine, which I was told about by my colleague uh, from the Lane Lit Department, Amber Lemire, um, is a really great uh, graphic novel um, that kind of deconstructs the news media um, and the complexities of modern media. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I strongly recommend it, as does NPR. Um, and so many others. Um, for instance, Green Lantern Legacy uh, came out earlier this year in January, uh, reconceives uh, the Green Lantern hero as a young uh, Vietnamese boy who gets the ring because the ring is always passed on to the next Green Lantern from his grandmother um, and just has really great stuff in it about, about the Vietnamese living in, in um, a big city, um, which uh, is a fictional city. You know, DC has these fictional cities like Metropolis and is there in Coast City? I'm not sure what that's supposed to be. Or what if Wonder Woman was a black woman? which hasn't happened, but would be really cool. <laughs> or uh, Marvel has been just reimagining all the characters. Here's Riri Williams, a young genius who became Ironheart and took on the role of Iron Man for a time. Uh, Jane Foster uh, uh, was, uh, the, was Thor for, for quite a while. Um, and Marvel Comics reconceived uh, Ms. Marvel as uh, a Muslim teen, which is not seen here, but is actually a thing. So, all right. I am at the end of my thing. Um, let's open it up to questions and riffing by me and Abby. Okay, so I have a couple questions that have come in from the audience. So we have, uh, first up, Jack Kirby was the most influential individual in the world of comic books. When he was asked about creating a black superhero character, he said, about time. 
He already had plans in creating a wide and diverse amount of characters and storylines. What are both of your opinions on this? Well, um, Jack was ashamed that it took him so long to create a, a, a black superhero because his best friend was black. Uh, like his first friend, he said in an interview one time. Um, Jack is actually the person behind the creation of most of the Marvel Comics properties. He even designed Spider-Man before passing it off to another artist who drew the first 25 or so issues, Steve Ditko, also recently RIP. Um, and, and uh, you know, um, that, you know, that's a, that's a big topic. <laughs> so those are my two quick thoughts. Um, but um, Jack Kirby is a really good example of someone who did a lot of the creative work uh, uh, to create all of these wonderful Marvel characters. And he uh, and his family have seen zero dollars um, uh, from all of the, the movies. So, um, but um, though sad when Stan Lee passed away last year because he was Stan Lee, you know, um, many of us that are that love comics, you know, were saying, "Hey, you know, that's that's really sad." But Jack Kirby was. Let's not forget about Jack Kirby, who died many, many years ago, and uh, and really was the the person that did most of the creating of all of these great characters. So, okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have another question. So there was an incident that happened during a recent run of X-Men where an artist, Artie and Saif, added anti-Semitic and anti-Christian messages through symbols on characters or backgrounds. Saif was eventually fired from Marvel. A formal apology was given by the Marvel Corporation. Does the comic book industry need to improve the review process, especially in our digital age? Or would this be a return to the McCarthy era of approved by the comic book industry stamp of approval? That's a tricky one. Um, it, this is really an isolated incident when it comes to anti-Semitic messages from uh, kind of an extremist, um, you know, from the Muslim faith. Um, so that's not indicative of a lot of Muslim people because there's another, the, actually the, the person that wrote uh, and really conceived of Ms. Marvel as a Muslim, G. Willow Wilson, um, is a practicing uh, Muslim um, and, and, you know, did great things for positive images of, you know, Muslim teenage American girls in New Jersey. Um, you know, I think comics are really good about self, uh, um, censoring and, and, and sort of monitoring, I don't want to use the word censoring, really sort of monitoring what they're doing. Um, I mean, it, are there sexist and racist things still in comics? Yeah, yeah. especially sexist. Uh, look, if you're interested, you know, just Google, um, you know, women in refrigerators um, and, and you'll find all sorts of really upsetting things. Um, but, um, you know, is it getting better and better and better? Absolutely. Um, just earlier this year, one of my absolute favorite comic book writers, someone who I, I consider a friend, even though I don't really know him because he wrote a weekly newsletter and, and um, was really a, a voice in my life every week, um, was accused of um, grooming women. No sexual assault necessarily, but this, I, I don't want to make excuses for, for behavior that's unacceptable. Um, using his power in the industry, uh, uh, you know, in, in ways that, that lots of other people would, you know, look down, and it's just not good. Um, and, uh, and the industry is even more aware of, of these kinds of things, both the messages in their comics and the actions of their creators. Um, and and uh, I think we're gonna see a lot more great stuff happening without having to have some sort of outside organization that, that would monitor comic books. Uh, we do have an organization called the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Uh, you could Google that, Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. It's really great. And they uh, champion censorship cases, which still happen. Um, in fact, I just noticed that there's a Texas case about the movie Cuties. It's not comic books, but um, that was censored by um, a te Texas legislator. Um, it's legislature. <laughs> so, yeah. Good question. Great question. 
Okay, and, and kind of going on that, um, Cassie wanted to know if there was uh, going to be a presentation on comics and anti-sexism, and I can answer that because I run the schedule, uh, not this quarter, but I would love to see that some, sometime in the future, so stay tuned. Uh, and then we have a question for Abby. Has the comic book industry done better to improve the image and messages for and of the LGBTQ plus community? Oh no, you're not frozen. Wondering. Why, why is Abby here exactly? Um, I am not a comic book expert. I don't pretend to be one. I have learned just as much as all of you have from Chris's wonderful expertise. Um, so I have, to, I have to default to Chris again on this. But I can tell you that hopefully in the future we can continue this conversation about whether we can separate the art from the artist because I think there's a lot of relevant points that have been brought up and that goes sort of across the board from comic books to short stories to poetry to whatever it might be painting sculptures so thank you for your question but chris any thoughts well and we were talking about you know the 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 need for change uh at the in, in the boardroom and you know in the publishing company it's not enough just to publish the work of of african-american writers you know we need um them to be in the in the positions of power to guide the choices if not whole companies, you know, uh, of, of those uh, individuals. That's a real diverse world uh, when we get to that. And we were talking about that. But um, it might surprise you to know that Archie Comics has actually addressed LBGTQ issues uh, with gay characters and, uh, and, and has done all kinds of interesting stuff. Like there's a lot of these fantasy issues in which Archie marries the drummer from Josie and the Pussycats, who's an African-American girl. Um, it's great stuff. So there's, there's more and more depictions of um, gay characters in comic books. Um, Marvel has done some stuff. Uh, they just uh, did a whole huge mini series called Empire, uh, where um, uh, former Young Avengers, um, who are a gay couple uh, and very well known in the Marvel Universe, Hulkling and uh, can't remember the Wiccan, um, uh, get married. Uh, so, you know, more and more and more um, that we're seeing um, those sorts of stories being told. Uh, um, I can't think of other examples off the top of my head, uh, but yeah, they're, they're out there. Um, and, and a lot of the best work is being done outside of superhero comics. So there's, there's so many great um, artists and creators that are telling their personal stories. I just ordered a couple of books of, of coming out stories. Um, uh, I can't remember the titles of off the top of my head, but I get a monthly catalog. If you go to a comic shop, it's this thing called previews and it's what's coming out in two months and it's, it's comics and games and stories and toys and t-shirts and t-shirts, you know, even though I actually bought this at Target, sad to say. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, there's great stuff out there to be found. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you very much. We are actually out of time, but I really appreciate uh, Chris and Abby for joining us today and giving us a good overview on a very interesting topic and very timely as well. And uh, I, you know, you're, you were given the RAPs and I've got to add um, Chadwick Boseman, you know, live on. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, please join us again next week. Yay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay, thank you all. Talk to you later.